So, I was originally going to start this off with some tacky, self-aware joke about how this is both my first video and one that covers a somewhat controversial subject matter. If you hadn't guessed already, I've decided instead to get straight into the point since I'm assuming you're smart enough to read the clickbait video title. Hey everyone, my name is Jake, and today I'm going to be ranting about the second generation of Pokémon games, Gold, Silver, and Crystal. Pokémon as a franchise is one that is very near and dear to me, as I've been playing these games fanatically since their Western debut with Red and Blue. A lot of people, myself included, who've played these games for so long seem to have very strong opinions about their favorite game in the series. Now don't worry, I'm not going to sit you down here for... uh, let's see here... Oh, God damn it! ...and try to argue which game in the franchise is objectively the best one. But something I have noticed, both within online communities and discussions between personal friends, is that there seems to be a very strong gravitation towards the earlier games in the series, specifically the first two generations. The positivity towards these games is so saturated within the community, it's as if these games were the unspoken holy grail of RPGs. There's a lot of love for these games, so I propose to you, is Pokémon Generation 2 overrated? Now you might be wondering to yourself, why would I be starting with Generation 2 and not the original games? Or more likely, you're wondering why this hack is shitting on my favorite game, get the fuck out of here. I'm starting with these games for two reasons, the first being, I am completely biased. And more importantly, I believe that there's enough information out there about the original games, flaws and all, for you to formulate your own opinion about them. Everyone knows about the problems with Gen 1, all the glitches, the broken mechanics, overpowered strategies, coupled with the knowledge that they were the first attempt of the franchise. You can either hate those games because of their flaws, or you can love the games to death in spite of them. But I feel like other games in the franchise don't really get the same kind of treatment. Like sure, you get the occasional, Oh wow, these new Pokemon games fucking suck, look at all these stupid designs. Or, Oh, the story and handholding is ruining the series. Or some equally uninspired complaint. But I haven't seen anybody go in depth with other games in the franchise individually and break down their pros and cons as much as I see for the first generation. Just to clarify and to give a fair context to all my rants, I've played these games. A lot. Like, way more than any normal human being should ever play a single video game. I've dedicated enough of my long-term memory to stuff like movesets and base stats, item locations, Pokémon evolutions, and other trivial bullshit that if I had put the same effort and energy into literally anything else, I could have become a doctor by now or something. But instead, here I am, talking about video games on the internet. Have I gotten the point across? Have I justified myself enough? Probably not, you're just gonna call me a hater anyway, why do I even bother with this shit? I just don't want to give off the impression that I'm calling out these games simply because I don't like them, because believe me, I do. I wouldn't dedicate enough of this energy and effort into criticizing something if I didn't love it. That being said, I'm aware that the general consensus of these games is very positive, and no matter how I try to justify it, breaking that perception is going to ruffle at least a few feathers. So even if you still love these games to death, after everything I'm about to present, that's perfectly okay. You should form your own opinions, not just take everything some rando speaking into a microphone says for granted. So, moving right along to the point, in order to answer if something seems overrated, first you must determine what makes them so highly regarded in the first place. Now I could go on forever about the sales figures, or how the game came out to critical acclaim and blah blah blah, but ultimately to consumers like you and me, those numbers don't mean anything. Those would be empty words. Why exactly do you love these games so much? Why do I love it as much as I do, despite what the video title may be implying? Well, there's a lot of reasons. The best place to start, I feel, would be the conception of these sequels. So let me paint this picture for you. Imagine you're working at Game Freak and your big dick's Atosi Dajiri himself, and you're finding out that Pokémon is hitting it off to a huge success right after Red and Green. This love project that you put together held by rubber bands and chewing gum about catching animal monsters and beating them to death has become a massive success. 
and now you are proposed with the idea of making another game. So where do you go from there? How do you follow up on this? Well, the easy answer, and basically what happened, is that you make the game bigger and you make more of them. Simple, right? You had a couple of scrap designs you couldn't make work in the first game, so just plop them right in with some new ones, make a new area that hits the same beats as the first game, and BAM! Instant sequel! Well, as we'll go on later in the video, maybe taking the easy way out wasn't such a great idea, but hey, for the time being it worked, and you know, the game sold, so gold star for you! But that's just a surface level observation of what's changed. Pokemon Gold and Silver were actually very ambitious titles, not just for Nintendo and Game Freak, but for video games as a whole. Outside of the mechanical changes to the combat and the Pokemon, these games actually put a lot into the package of this tiny Game Boy cart. These were some of the first games to actually have a real day and night cycle. Now, you did have dedicated day and night sections in games before, but they were clunky and segmented. Either the game came to a screeching halt when it was time to change, or the game specifically scripted it to be day or night depending on the level. It almost never flowed naturally. And this isn't just a five minute timer that switches between the two states. The flow of day and night is synced with what time it is in the real world, which was fucking rad for the time. Like, it's nighttime in the real world, so it's gonna be nighttime in the video game. It just makes perfect sense. Now, the system wasn't perfect. They were still tinkering around with the idea of having clocks tied to internal batteries. Many people who played these games in the original releases know by now that the same battery that powered the clock was the same one that held their save files, which almost all by now have gone out and have to have been replaced. Unfortunate as that is, it was still a really cool concept and I'm glad they went for it. Generation 2 also added in the Poke Gear, which included a cell phone app and a radio app, which I guess added a lot of flavor to the world of Johto. Most trainers you fought could be recorded into your phone's call list, and they would talk to you from time to time about their own adventures, and even challenge you to rematches. This and the radio added a lot of that lived-in feeling for these games. Some IMMERSION to throw around that buzzword. You also had a major theme in the story of the game, revolting around Pokémon as friends more than they are tools or just numbers on the screen. This kind of shonen themed storytelling was pretty popular at the time for kids' games in Japan, and I think it really resonated with people who played these games in the States when they were younger. Through the means of characters like your rival and some other key players in the story, the idea was drilled into your head that you should play the game using your favorite Pokémon, not necessarily ones that you think are objectively the best. This carried on through to some of the stuff you did in the game as well. This time around, you're not beating up Team Rocket because they're gangsters who threaten people with Pokémon. You defeat them specifically because what they do puts the lives of Pokémon in danger. When you get to Olivine City, the gym leader won't bow you until you help out her sick Pokémon friend. Helping out your fellow Pokémon is more important in this game's world than battling them. While this is all nice and fun, it's inherently contradictory to a game about numbers and combat. Like, all this talk about friends being the ultimate weapon didn't stop me from only using my starter and some legendaries on my first playthrough when I was a kid. <sighs> Maybe this is just me being a jaded adult with no passion for life anymore. But all I see in this theme is just an excuse to make the game extremely easy so that some of the, let's say, lesser new additions had a fighting chance to become someone's new favorite. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The point is that this game was more story-focused this time around, which may have helped some people build a connection to these games. So let's continue on. As for major mechanical changes, I should definitely mention the splitting of the special stat and the addition of Steel and Dark-type Pokémon. Now, don't get too excited. Steel and Dark-types have their fair share of issues, which I'll be getting into later, but on a conceptual level, they played an important role in shifting the balance of power in the type system. The major important change being that in Generation 1, the Psychic-type was absurdly overpowered with no functional weaknesses, mostly due to bugs and, well, let's just call them balancing issues. And as a result, the Steel and Dark types were created to be somewhat of a counter to Psychic, in addition to fixes for some of the other types that were supposed to be counters to Psychic originally. Making the big question of the hour, was Psychic actually brought down a peg this time around? Ultimately, the answer to that question was yes, though I believe that was mostly due to the special stat being split this time around. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty about the meta of Generation 1, but suffice it to say that mo a lot of the most powerful Pokémon in that game were both Psychic type and had a very large special stat. All in all, these are both very good changes, even if it did take a little bit of further tweaking to get it just right. Going beyond that, this game also added breeding as a mechanic into the game, which I'm personally torn on whether or not I feel like it was a good addition to the series. Now don't get me wrong, I'll be the first one to jump at the opportunity to ruin a child-friendly game with lewdness, but the process is very complex. It definitely flushes out the world more, knowing that Pokémon reproduce and that some species can't be found in the wild and must be obtained by breeding, 
but these Pokémon don't really serve a functional purpose unless you're the kind of person who chooses Pokémon based on their design alone. To briefly touch on the subject, I feel like the idea of pre-evolutions to Pokémon are such an underutilized concept, since they could have been used to give access to some of the more powerful families of Pokémon to the player in earlier stages of the game without feeling overpowered, but they never really capitalize on this idea until at least Generation 5, making them feel like wasted potential. On the other hand of breeding, the deeper mechanics allow the player to have a little more control over the randomness of the effects of Pokémon's stats upon birth, but that comes at the cost of making the process extremely complicated and tedious on top of that. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad that there is some kind of means of controlling the random output of stats, but I feel like by this point in the series, instead of making breeding easier and easier, they should just streamline the process altogether. Like, they could just let you pay an NPC off to access a slider menu and distribute the stats that way, or play some dumb minigame that determines the IVs and nature or whatever. I'm just throwing around ideas. I mean, even if you're the kind of person to play Pokémon competitively, answer me this. Would you rather do this for upwards to hundreds of hours to complete your team, or do this? Even then, most people who compete in tournaments just hack their Pokémon in anyway, so why even bother? Sorry, I got a bit off track there. Breeding is at the very least an interesting addition, and an inoffensive one at that, so it gets a pass in my book. Lastly to cover on the additions is shiny Pokémon and hold items. Hold items which, while very basic in this version of the game, are a very positive change. Like, I don't need to explain much here, you can equip an item to your Pokémon for some passive effect. It's never required to do in the game, but it can have just barely that much of an effect to change the flow of a battle in your favor if used creatively. It's not too complicated, nor do hold items ever overstay their welcome, so it's a positive addition in my opinion. And shiny Pokémon are really just a small change. Unlike breeding, it doesn't really have a practical effect on your Pokémon, so it's understandable why it's so obscenely rare to come across one. It's really just for bragging rights. Yeah, not too much to say on that subject. So yeah, there was a lot of really neat shit added into these games. But ultimately, I feel like the biggest reasons people like these games so much nowadays is one, due to the overall experience of the game, and two, being the big elephant of the room, unfortunately being the nostalgia factor. I'm not gonna pretend like this isn't a big issue. Pokémon Gold and Silver were released at the turn of the century, the absolute height of Pokémania. Generation 1 were worldwide phenomenons, the TCG was taking the nation by storm, the spin-off games on the N64 only broadened the brand awareness, the anime was just finishing its first major arc during its run in the West, and they had just released their second major theatrical release. Many children who were exposed to Pokémon during its rise to fame were likely in their adolescent phases at this time, so that's undoubtedly a big reason why these games felt so memorable. But that's to speak nothing of the elements that make up the core experience of Generation 2, some of which I've exposed on, but many of which I'll continue to talk about. It's how all these elements are put together that make for such a memorable game, and if there's one good thing I'll say about GSC is that it's a memorable game. There's just moments there that stick out to you and leave a lasting impression. And if you're the kind of person who plays a game once and leaves it alone, which is perfectly fine, that's probably why it feels so good to reminisce on these games so fondly. It's only when you start to pull the curtains back and take another, closer look at these games where the shortcomings start to rear their ugly heads in and give you those looks of confusion. It's like, oh shit, you're back so soon? Uh, I, I kinda didn't expect this, uh, I, I don't really have anything else to offer you. Did, do you wanna go have another bug catching contest or something? Or go collect some berries? Where the fuck am I going with this joke? Now, I'm not trying to sell you on the idea that Gold, Silver, and Crystal have no replay value, far from it. Pokémon games inherently are good for multiple playthroughs on the single merit of catching a new team and trying out new strategies. It's just not quite as good for a second time through as most other Pokémon games, I feel. The problems mostly lie in the progression of the game, which, for the purposes of this video, is an umbrella term. When I say the progression of the game, I really mean three different things, mostly the difficulty curve, the selection of Pokémon and their availability, and the variety of things for you to do along your adventure. Remember how I said that Generation 2 was a very ambitious game? Well, with these risks come the downside of detracting from the core experience. That earlier stuff I mentioned, the non-mechanical changes like the Poke Gear and the day and night cycle were just that, non-mechanics. The fact that you get to experience the game a day or night doesn't actually change what happens to the story or what you can do in the game, just a few side events and some Pokemon encounter rates are tied to the time of day. The phone app doesn't really have too much purpose behind it, 
Some trainers can rematch you, but you have no control over which trainers do and when they request it. It's all just random and too tedious to be used reliably as a means of training. The radio is only used once in the entire game as a substitute for something that was just a key item in the original games. All these new ideas are interesting, but they don't change what you actively do in the game, which is catching and battling Pokémon, besides minimal aesthetic changes. You could even argue that breeding falls under this category as well, since the time invested needed to get a practical result ultimately defeats the purpose of giving you an advantage in battle. It's only good for some variety in your Pokédex completion and for some competitive team building. I get the feeling that all these ideas were just thrown to the wall and they saw what stuck based on the initial feeling that developers had about them, and not whether or not they actually contributed to the actions the player has in the game. Like maybe Game Freak just really wanted to have cell phones in their games since they were starting to become very popular at the time, even if all it did was just inconvenience player at random intervals. Kinda like real phones. Sure, it adds to the aesthetic and makes for a memorable mechanic, but it doesn't change the fact that it's ultimately useless. Now, before I go too deep into the shortcomings and the events of the game and its main story, I feel like I should mention the effort put in by the late Satoru Iwata. Iwata wasn't unfamiliar with the Pokémon series at this point, as he had lent his hand helping out with the international releases of Pokémon Stadium and the international releases of the Generation 1 games before that. Before Gold and Silver were released, he took a close look at the game and saw that there wasn't a whole lot to it, and he took it upon himself to compress the data being put on the card so that the entire second act of the game could fit on there. As a programmer myself, I'd just like to briefly state how this astounds me, how one person could take in another team's messy, incomprehensible code at a machine-level language, figure it all out, and optimize it so that new shit could be added. Like, knowing firsthand how difficult deciphering other people's code can be, in addition to the fact that you're working with code in the early life cycle of video game programming, that sounds like nothing short of a miracle to me. These kind of stories makes my onyx harden. Let's just check that one off the list. But this also raises a deep fear inside of me. Not to undermine the immense work put into this game, but if this is what we got, I dread to think about how little the game had in its early stages. I'll be real with you, this game is deceptively short. Not in playtime or in new features, but in meaningful content. Even going through the post-game in Kanto, where there's a lot to keep you busy and things to extend the playtime, Generation 2 just feels bloated. I'll go a little further in depth with this idea when I talk about the difficulty curve in a little bit, but after a certain point in the game, it just feels like you're going through the motions with very few standout moments. Sure, you go to new places and see and do new things from time to time, but this is one of the few things that's subjective in my opinion about Generation 2, and that just a lot of it feels tedious. Sure, you got optional content like some dungeons and the side quests involving the legendary Pokémon in these games, but I don't know, there's just something about all the side stuff in this game that makes me ask, what's the point? Maybe it's the over-reliance on HM moves, the fact that most areas in the game, required or otherwise, have Pokémon that are just so under-leveled compared to what you should have at that time. It's not something I can just show out right in front of you and expect everyone to understand. The closest rational argument I have is that the game just gets too easy after a certain point, but it really is more than that. Game Freak clearly saw this too, they flat out admitted that the adventure up into the Elite Four was lacking and that they needed the extra space to make the game feel complete. Which brings us to the big boy himself. I'm gonna say it, this is gonna be one of the big hot takes from this video. Kanto was a mistake. Now, don't get me wrong, I love that they had the foresight to add all this content into the game. The initial reveal blew my mind just like the rest of the players in my initial playthrough. Hey! It's the place from the first game! Wow! I remember that shit! Like, this was really fucking rad, not just for Pokémon, but again, a neat thing for any video game to have for the time. I only wish that playing through this part of the game was just as exciting as the reveal. Because after only five minutes of stepping foot onto the old stopping grounds, I realized how gutted and empty the place was. You're not exploring and adventuring through new territory in this part of the game, you're just doing cleanup duty! I said before that Kanto and Johto were two parts of a two-act structure, but it doesn't really feel like half of the game. Kanto feels more like a third of what you're doing, mostly because there's nothing to break the pace. You've got one major side quest that opens up half of the region, and other than that, it's just gym leader after gym leader and not much else to do. 
I'll go in more depth with these topics soon, as there's so much to my argument here, but the difficulty and selection of Pokemon in the Kanto portion of Generation 2 is so badly paced, it just ruins the entire experience for me. I feel like this part of the game just needed a little more time in the oven to truly feel like the oh, second hey. act of a grand adventure, and not just too much dressing on top. Like, imagine if Team Rocket's plan in the radio tower had ended up successful and Giovanni had gotten their message. What if at some point in your Kanto adventure you had to track him down and finish off Team Rocket for good before tackling a few of the gyms there? It would have gone miles just to have that break in the activity, plus it could have made for a climactic moment that the game was building towards the entire time. This one's just a smaller nitpick, but Team Rocket's goals in this game just felt a little downplayed, and they kinda just went out with a whimper and not a big bang. You could have even had the big reveal about how Silver is actually Giovanni's son at this part, and not just heavily hint towards it. Even your fucking rival doesn't have a satisfying conclusion to his arc. He just says, Oh, hey, I learned my lesson, I won't be a fucking douchebag anymore, my bad! This is just an idea I had at the top of my head. The whole point is that there just could have been something, anything to take a break from the gym action or actually pose a serious threat. And that finally brings us to the difficulty. If you asked me if Gold and Silver were hard games, I would tell you no, but with a big, fat, pulsing asterisk. 90% of the fighting that you do in this game is some of the most brain-dead, easy button mashing you'll do in any Pokémon game. I mentioned this before, but most of the game has you fighting enemies that are so under-leveled compared to what's expected to you by that point in the game that there's no reason to fight most trainers and just go for the required routes. Now, maybe you just think the game doesn't expect that much of you, like, we're talking about Pokémon here, the cute, cuddly monster game, but don't forget that ugly asterisk I just spoke about. The game still does expect you to be competent sometimes, and those few times are such a leap in comparison to the rest of the slaughter that it just stands out so much more. Now, don't get me wrong here, the hard fights in this game aren't too much more difficult than the peaks and difficulty of other Pokémon games, but the huge dissonance is what bothers me so much. Not to mention that there's just so few and far in between. I could count the number of fights that are actually challenging on my fingers for this game. Here, I've even taken the liberty of filling out a chart. You know, like I actually put some effort into my bullshit rants. It represents the peaks and the dips in the game's difficulty throughout the main adventure. Now, I don't exactly expect this to be 100% accurate to everyone's experience of the game. Hell, even for me, some fights can be easier than others depending on my team composition. But I measured this out for relativity's sake, not exactly for complete accuracy. Just for starters, take a good look at this mess, it's all over the place! Just for reference, here's what I believe a well-designed game's difficulty curve should look like. Not to an exact T, mind you, but I don't think I'll get too many heads turned by saying that a game should naturally pace the difficulty to build upon itself as the game progresses. With a few peaks and dips to fit the narrative, of course, so long as the difficulty curves upward as a whole. To be clear, huge difficulty spikes in a game are not exactly a bad thing, they can be used effectively to make a memorable moment or to give the player a power trip, or even to bring them down from one. The problem I have with Generation 2's difficulty curve doesn't necessarily lie within the high spikes, but the low dips in between them that fail to bring the player up to speed by the time the next one comes around. Now, turn-based RPGs are no stranger to weird and unnatural difficulty curves, especially ones from the earlier years. I'm looking at you, Atlas. This is mostly due to these games being all about the numbers, and maybe one or two segments are improperly balanced. This flaw really comes to fruition around this point in the game and everything thereafter, but I'll get to that. First, I just kind of want to go through the chart and explain how the pacing of the game's difficulty sets itself up kind of well in the beginning, only to fall off at this exact moment. So here we are at the start of the game, and you can see that it curves up pretty naturally, it's a good time all around. You have a few gym fights, a dungeon or two, and then you have the second gym, which is usually a cakewalk since bug types, even a scyther, is pretty easy at this stage in the game. It all serves just to bring up your ego, only to crush it back down when you have to do rival fight number two. With his evolved starter Pokémon, this is easily the hardest fight you've had to do up until this point in the game. Then the game gives you a nice little break after that difficult fight up until the next gym, where we get to the infamous Miltank. I almost wanted to avoid bringing up this subject altogether in the video since it's just so overplayed, but nonetheless, it's an infamous fight for a reason. The mill tank is, well, tanky, with moves that become more deadly the longer that's allowed to live. A strategy that is so effective that, in an ironic turn of fate, is probably the basis for one of the most overpowered strategies in Generation 2's metagame. Now, as I said before, this fight isn't particularly too much tougher than other Pokémon games, like I feel a good comparison would be Misty's Starmie in Gen 1. 
but the key differences between the two and why this fight is so much more reviled is due to the two main factors. The first being the fact that there are only a few checks or counters available to you at this point in the game for this particular Pokemon, and the second being the huge spike in difficulty compared to what you faced up until this point, and more importantly, compared to what comes after. Whitney isn't particularly a hard fight when you realize that a Geodude, an Onyx, or a Machop that you can trade for in the very same town completely shuts her down. Not to mention the fact that in Generation 2, it's really easy just to overlevel a starter Pokémon and sweep most if not all of the game with it, at least from this point onward. I didn't mention this up until this point, but it's only when you want to use a balanced team where this difficulty curve comes into play. If you just want to use one super powerful Pokémon and sweep the game with it, the game does let you do that, but it changes what little difficulty curve this game already has and just presents a flat, boring line instead. If you've ever used a legendary Pokémon in any of these games, you know exactly what I mean. You can also make the game harder for yourself by filling your team up with really bad Pokémon instead, but we'll get to that, don't you worry. Anyway, after Whitney, you only have the next gym to present any semblance of a challenge until the game opens itself up a little, and this, I believe, is the turning point to where the good pacing of this game decides to take a nosedive. Where Generation 1 balanced its open-ended segments by making some areas more difficult than others to create somewhat of an intended route with a natural difficulty curve, this game just makes the next 25% of the game the same general difficulty. Meaning that, by the time you've taken on maybe even one more gym or dungeon, the next three are going to be a boring, tedious slog. You're going to be spending the next five hours or so just grinding through easy fights until you make it to the eighth gym, where the game finally presents another fairly paced challenge, and remains pretty balanced until the Elite Four, where... Whoa, 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 hey, hey, do you see that? Yeah, that's a... that's a big ol' spike. Now some of you may be saying to yourself, I don't remember the Elite Four being that challenging back when I first played the game, and yeah, I didn't either the first time I played. Back to what I was saying before, when I was just a shit-eating little kid, I breezed through this game with just my Feraligator. It was easily a good 10 levels above everything the Elite Four had to present to me at this point, mostly because I never needed to use anything else. It was the path of least resistance, but not necessarily the most interesting one. To most people, the difficult fights in the earlier section of the game were only memorable because it was too early for you to become overpowered. If you ever try to replay this game and use a diverse team, this is where the game decides to slap your shit in and tell you to go grind. Even if you fought every single trainer in the game up until this point, your team will easily land in the mid to late 30s, where the Elite Four has Pokémon in the 40 to 50 range. It really doesn't help that all of the wild Pokémon that you can go and grind against in the surrounding area or anywhere else that you have access to at this point in the game are only going to be as high as the low 30s. Even your rival, who's supposed to be your final challenge in the big test before the Elite Four, doesn't even hit level 40 with any of its Pokémon where the previous gym leader did! This isn't a natural difficulty spike, it isn't a memorable fight or two that tests your skill and your abilities that you've gained along the adventure, it's just a grind filter. I'm not necessarily saying you are going to lose these fights, but it's just going to be challenging no matter what. And I get it, this is supposed to be a hard series of fights, but the problem is that no matter how you've tackled the game up until this point, it will either be far too easy or far too hard right here. There is no in-between. In the case of the latter, it's just an excuse for the game to tack on another hour of grinding, which is basically all of what you've done up until this point anyway, so whatever, prove my point. And then, when you've finally beaten the first act, you've become the champion, you finally get the privilege to go to the long-foretold region of Kanto, where all of your dreams can come true, what do you think happens next? Oh... Oh... Oh no... I've said it before, and I will say it again, it's boring. It takes the same approach to non-linearity as this earlier midpoint in that all seven of the first Kanto gyms required to progress through the game and Challenge Blue are in the same level range. The first gym that you fight is the only one that will actually put one up, and it's all downhill from there. It's only insult to injury when you find out that pretty much all of the trainers in Kanto are around the same level range as your not-victory-road trainers before the Elite Four. 
except this time they're not really there to bring you up to speed for an upcoming challenge, it's just to be tedious. I hope you're excited for yet another 6 or 7 hours of effectively just grinding, because that's what all of Kanto is up until the end. And don't think to yourself that you can look forward to adding another team member to your party just to break up the pace, because all of the wild Pokémon in Kanto are severely underleveled. Like, you might be able to get away with adding one new party member if you use your experience share, but it's gotta be a real game changer. And you need to beeline it right for that motherfucker. Otherwise, those experience points would just go to as much use on your current party that brought you up until this point. The only exception being this fat fuck. It's like the game knew that they were bullshitting you throughout the entire reason and gave you an overleveled, guaranteed encounter with the most powerful Pokémon in the game, if the meta is to be believed anyway. It's like, yeah, sorry mate, I know shit sucked for the most part, take this one on the house. Anyway, it's only once you finally get to the end of the game with the fights with Blue and Red where the challenge starts to pick up again. And unlike the Elite Four fights, this spike in difficulty is actually pretty fun and exciting. On top of that, how many games can you say lets you fight the player avatar from the earlier game in the series? I cannot understate how brilliant the red fight is from a narrative aspect. If you've beaten every single trainer in the world, who else could match you but your previous incarnation? It's the real finale of the game, where all of your options have been made available, it's the ending after the ending. And if you're anything like me, you'll more than likely have a few trainers that you skipped over, which you can go back to if the challenge is too much for you. Even so, the level difference between you and your opponents shouldn't be too much of an issue at this point in the game. This is mostly because you finally have the full effects of badge boosts right now. Badge boosts being a mechanic that went completely over my head until I decided to do research for this video. For what I can only assume is the majority of people who don't know, Badge Boosts are mechanic that are introduced in the first three generations of Pokémon. Occasionally, whenever you defeat a Gym Leader, they'll go off on a little tangent about how this badge boosts a specific stat a little. You can't actually see the changes in your menus, the Pokémon stats don't actually change because it's all hidden from the player. But in Generation 2 specifically, Badge Boosts have a hidden mechanic that they don't even mention to you at all. In these games, the badges also give an additional boost to attacking moves of the same type as the Gym. Both the badge's stat boosts and the attacking move boosts are equal to about 12.5%. So for example, if you have the badge that boosts your attack stat, and the badge that boosts flying moves, all flying moves from that point in the game get a 25% boost. By the way, can you guess which badge gives you the attack stat boost? That's fucking right. This goes to explain why physical attackers, specifically ones that use normal and flying type moves, are extremely overpowered in this game. This also goes on to explain why Generation 2 just feels so easy overall. It's not just the levels of the trainers that you fight up against, but all of your stats get boosted on top of that. By the time you get to the end game, you'll have an additional boost in all of your stats and for all offensive move types except for Dark. On top of this, because of how EVs operate, your team should actually be on par with someone that's about 10 to 20 levels ahead of you. In addition, the AI doesn't use effort values on their Pokémon, and let's be real here, the artificial intelligence isn't the smartest in the world. The same excuse couldn't quite be made with the Elite Four since it's earlier in the game, so you wouldn't have maxed out your effort values, you wouldn't have all of your badge boosts, and the strongest Pokémon you fight there are in the late 40s, a good 10 levels ahead of you, it just doesn't really balance out the same way. I know to most people who aren't really well versed in the deeper mechanics of Pokémon, all of this sounds like a lot of bullshit, but suffice it to say that a difference in levels between you and your opponent's Pokémon is far less of an issue the later in the game that you are, by an almost exponential degree. Anyone who's played any of these games can probably attest to that. So I wouldn't exactly say the game redeems itself with these last few fights, since 80% of what you've been doing up until this point has been... But I will give it credit for making an exciting post-game finale, something that the Pokémon series hasn't really recreated the same way since. And with that out of the way, I think it's finally time to start talking about the Pokémon themselves. I'm gonna be completely honest real fast before we get into the nitty gritty, I'm not the biggest fan in the world of Gen 2's overall design philosophy. Now I'm not gonna tell you that every Pokémon here looks like shit, 
you've got a lot of real good contenders and a couple of personal favorites in thrown in the mix too. But you can clearly tell that a design philosophy heavily saturates towards cute mascot designs. And again, there's nothing wrong with them. I'm not going to tell you that the designers just ran out of ideas, though technically most of these were leftovers from Gen 1, but... This does start to have a problem when we consider how many of these Pokémon are effective members of your party in the core gameplay. It also doesn't help that, until way, way later in Generation 6, the Pokémon additions this time around are the fewest and furthest between of any Pokémon game. It's very easy to make the argument that they didn't really have too many ideas and they just wanted to ride the wave of popularity as long as they could, but I know for a fact that wasn't the case. What is an unfortunate truth is that the grand majority of Pokémon that were made available to the player are all from Generation 1. Not to mention the large number of new Pokémon which were made as part of families introduced in Generation 1. You can see it more so in this game than any other game in the series. Making a team of Pokémon made exclusively of new additions is so difficult to do this time around. Not only because of the low number of them, but because 1. A lot of the new Pokémon are not made available to the player until way past the point that they should have a complete team, but also because it's unfortunate to say that a lot of new Pokémon introduced in Generation 2 are just not really good. Like, it really feels like the designers just made something up and said, Yeah, that looks cool. Just put it in. Without thinking of how useful the Pokémon would actually be. Now, if I were not a petty person making a concise video that does not beat the point into your skull until you bleed, I wouldn't go through each family of Pokémon in Generation 2 and break down exactly why the vast majority of them are not that great to use in-game, detailing you the problems that the Pokémon in this game present via bad stats, horrible move pools, poor availability, version exclusivity, and absurd evolution requirements. But I am, and clearly this isn't, so let's fucking go. So here we have all the Pokémon introduced in Generation 2. Just a heads up, I'm gonna be rattling on about these boys and girls for pretty much the rest of the video, so if you don't want to hear me prattle on about individual Pokémon for 25 minutes, just go ahead and skip to the end here, I won't blame you. I'm gonna be tackling through the majority of this list and tell you whether or not a Pokémon should be used on a regular playthrough of the game. By regular playthrough, I mean we're just going from start to finish on a single card of the game, no competitive bullshit involved. We're about to get some spicy opinions up in this bitch, so if you can't handle me talking shit about your favorite... Pineco? It, it, it's literally just a pineco and how can anyone like this garbage? Then you can just leave right now. First off, I don't have a lot of time left and this video is long enough already, so I'm gonna have to knock some guys off the list entirely right now. I'm just gonna black out anyone who I feel is just an unviable choice for your playthrough. For simplicity's sake, let's say anyone you can't obtain past a certain point in the game. How about the 8th gym? You should absolutely have a full team of 6 by this point, and it still includes the majority of Johto, just not Mount Silver or anywhere you need the Super Rod or Waterfall HM to get. Don't forget that the post-game Pokémon aren't just available to you really late in the game, but they also give them to you at an extremely low level. Next, I'm gonna cross off anyone with family ties in other generations. For pre-evolutions, this should be an obvious reason. For Pokémon who evolve in Generation 4, it's basically because Game Freak themselves thought these guys needed buffs to be useful. I could go off on this long tangent about how some Pokémon are okay to use if you're playing the remakes of these games, Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and that these games are actually the definitive versions of the game, but I'm in a time crunch and this video isn't about these games. They still have their problems, but they're better all around, I'll leave them at that. Lastly, we got the Gen 1 evolutions. Some of these guys are okay and I'll put them on the side for now, but this bitch is only in the post-game and for the rest we have the trade evolutions. Yeah, got Common Rider, Big Snick, look ma, no jaggies, Satan, I'm you but worse, and Kevin. Fuck you, Kevin. Personally, I'm throwing all these out the window because I don't think it's fair to assume that everyone has access to trades. God knows I didn't have any friends back then. And even then, half of these guys need hold items that you get in the post-game anyway. Last, we need to cross off some legendaries. I shouldn't have to explain this one too much, but for the naysayers, if I'm gonna tell you not to use a bad Pokémon because it makes the game too hard, I'm also not gonna tell you to use something that's obviously overpowered because it makes the game too easy. So with all that out of the way, let's go balls deep into the Pokémon of Generation 2. Don't take that out of context. 
One last little thing before we get started. With what little Pokemon we have left, I'm going to organize into three groups. Pokemon I'd actually recommend, ones that are hard maybes, and ones you should avoid like the fucking plague. Just to clarify, maybe is more like a... Mm, don't say I didn't warn you more than an actual recommendation. Well, to start off, we have the starters. I'm not going to cross any of them off here, but I am going to point out that I do think Generation 2's starters are some of the weakest in terms of the franchise. Don't get me wrong, Feraligator and Typhlosion look awesome, and they're fucking beasts, and they're my bros forever, but I can tell you that they don't really do that much. They're still good, mind you, like I said before, you can sweep through most of the game by overleveling any of the starters, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell you that Typhlosion's just a wingless Charizard, Feraligator wants to be a physical mono-water type, which is a bad idea and even outclassed by Gyarados, and... Oh boy, this thing. When I played through these games again for the sake of recording for this video, I tried giving Meganium a second chance. I've only ever used it once or twice, and I didn't think much of it other than it was the worst of the three starters. But man, do I regret this decision. For one, Monograss types should never try to be tanky, yes, I'm looking at you too. And second, I mean, just look at these moves, you've got so little to work with here. Sure, you get Razor Leaf early on, but that's your only grass type attack unless you want to use a TM, and spoilers, the grass type TMs aren't that great in this game. But whatever, I've got bigger fish to fry. I'll give you a pass along with the other starters since Generation 2 is relatively easy. Just for the record, it's the worst starter ever made. Next, we have Hoot Hoot and Centret, the regional bird and rodent of these games. I shouldn't have to explain it too much, these tropes are never meant to be permanent party members. Well, I guess sometimes with the bird it's okay, but... To put it simply, their stats are bad and so are their moves, unless you feel like wasting some good TMs on Furret, which... You shouldn't just trust me on this. It really says a lot when you're outclassed by your Generation 1 counterparts in almost every regard. Like, even the Flying-type Jim would rather use Pidgeotto and a Sparrow than a Hoot Hoot. Then we have... these bitches. I'm not exaggerating when I say that these two families are among the worst bug types that Game Freak have ever made. Like before, the early game bug type trope is also meant to be a party filler until later on, usually via a high stat Pokemon or some status coverage for the first few hours of the game, but these fuckers can't even get that right. First of all, these two evolve very late for their trope, and their final stats are even worse than most. Don't let that 90 stat and attack for Ariados fool you, let me show you this thing's moves. Fucking nothing. Not even TMs can save this piece of garbage. It doesn't even get a normal type move to spam with. And Ladian isn't even that much better off. Where Ariados has stats but no moves, Ladian has some eh moves in its pool but no stats to use them with. These two are just sad and actually really perfect examples for why the majority of Pokemon in this generation are just underwhelming. Quickly over here is Crobat, the first generation 1 evolution I'm going to be looking at, and honestly, he's a keeper. Good stats, good enough move pull, all things considered, Crobat's okay in my opinion. It's a little bit difficult to raise one in these games specifically because Zubat's early moveset is low damage and focused around confusion, and friendship's kind of a hard mechanic to get around, to this game at least, but the investment is worth it. Next is Lantern, a unique Pokemon for sure. Its whole point is the water electric typing, since its stats aren't particularly anything to write home about. It's a bit tanky, with some decent status moves, and you can get it right around the time you get the Surf HM, so it won't be lacking in water moves either. If you feel like grinding one out, you can also teach it the Thunder TM and Ice Beam and Crystal. It's okay, just not great. It also makes for a decent HM slave, so there's that. Natu and Zatu are tough cookies. They've got a really cool typing, and Zatu ends up with some decent stats for these games, but they have very few moves, and the ones that they do learn are learned so late into the game that it kind of just defeats the point. Even the few good TMs they have are victim to this, so I can't in good conscience recommend them. Alright, back onto a positive note, the Mareep line is one that instantly comes to my mind when I think about the few good Pokémon in Generation 2. They evolve early, they've got great stats, including a monstrous special attack, with speed being the only downside. Its moves are just barely good enough to get by as well, including access to the Fire Punch TM, which is a special move in this game. Honestly, considering what you have to work with, it's one of the best new Pokémon in this generation, despite it falling victim to Power Creep later down the line. Which is why it's such a kick in the dick why they deny you access to this Pokémon in Crystal version. 
Oh, 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 right, Blossom. Um, I'll be real here, I almost forgot about this thing when I talked about the Generation 1 evolutions. I'm not even sure if I should count this, since while you can get the Sunstone by winning a bug catching contest, it's completely the result of RNG, whether you win the contest and which prize you obtain. There's not really much to say about it. It's almost exactly the same as Vileplume, just not a poison type, which kind of makes it worse in my opinion, and it gets 10 points in special defense at the cost of 10 special attack. It kind of just feels like the same Pokemon, so I'll leave it with that and say that it says a lot when what's probably the best grass type in the entire game is almost identical to one that was just middle of the road last time. Next up is Azumarill, which doesn't quite feel like the Pokemon it was meant to be in these games. It's a Pokemon that only gets better and better with each passing generation due to their mechanical changes, and as such, Generation 2 is the worst that this guy has ever been. Not to say that it's completely garbage, it's got good bulk and a decent move pool, just not one that takes advantage of its stats. It doesn't help that much that in Gold, Silver, and Not Crystal, it has a 1% encounter rate in one room of an optional dungeon, meaning that you are more than likely not going to get one unless you hunt it down. I'll be real here, it's only really good as an HM slave. There's better water types out there, even in Generation 2. Now for Sudowoodo, and I actually like him despite his goofy look. He makes a great physical while an attacker and has some good moves to back up that role. He's not exactly the best Pokemon in this role, but far from the worst. If Geodode wasn't available earlier in the game, I'd honestly say that Sudowoodo is one of the best ones out there. He's nice. Ugh, and here's this motherfucker. Look at him go. What a tool. Really, Hopip's line just reeks of, I like this design and it's going into the game, I don't care if he's shit. Because this Pokemon really cannot do anything useful. It's fast and it has status moves, but no attacking stats or moves. Remember what I said about Ladian? Just go back and rewatch that part, same shit, different day. Sunkern over here gets a special mention for, to this day, being the Pokemon with the lowest base stats of anything in the series. But what about Sunflora? It's a rare instance of a stone evolution that actually gets better the sooner you evolve it. Something about its role and its stats at first glance remind me a bit of Ampharos, but don't be fooled, this thing is not nearly as good. If you're really desperate for a grass type and don't want to use one of the better ones from Generation 1, I guess give it a shot, but really that's all this thing is. It's not as bad as Jump Bluff back there, but really, Sunflora is just a one trick for strong grass type attacks. Okay, so Wooper and Quagsire are Pokemon that speak to me on a very deep level. You might look at this thing's stats and say that it's not that impressive, but I urge you to actually use this thing if you've never had the chance before. Quagsire is not a water type. It is a ground type that has access to water to block out some of its weaknesses. It's one of the earliest users of the move Earthquake in the entire series, and it's a decent temporary user of Surf right when you get it, though I'd recommend using it alongside another water type if possible. It's got a decent move pool, which isn't useful in every situation, but when you find its niche, it's one of the best Pokemon out there. This blue-ass motherfucker does not care what you think about him. He knows his role, and he's just happy to be alive. Umbreon and Espeon are decent Pokemon, and I'll go over them quickly together. Pretty much all of the evolutions are good in their own right, and these are no exceptions. They've got good stats and a clear role to play, the only downsides being that Espeon has nothing other than its stab for special moves until late game, and Umbreon, while very good at playing its role, is not a role that fits very well in the singer player experience. By no means are either of them bad Pokemon to use, just be careful as there are better options out there. I'll give them a pass and simply point out that it's in competitive play where these two really shine. Quickly before moving on, while Umbreon is fresh in your minds, I'd like to quickly point out Murkrow over here. While I could go on about how bad it is and how it desperately needed its Generation 4 evolution, it's blacked out here because Murkrow is only available in Kanto, and at a very low level at that. Let's just skip ahead a little and look for Sneasel, Tyranitar, Houndour, and wouldn't you know it, they all have the same problem. Why were all the Dark types in this game except for Umbreon made available only in the post-game? Even then, all of these Pokémon except for Houndour and Tyranitar are really bad special attackers. This is a serious problem. People argue that Game Freak added the Dark type in, as well as developed Ghosts and Bug types in order to nerf out Psychic, which ran rapidly in Generation 1, but they really didn't do a good job at making these counters both good and readily available. You can also already see that the only Ghost type in Generation 2, Mischievous, is in the post-game only. 
We've already gone through half of the bugs, and spoilers, only one of them gets the only new bug type move in the game, and it's only super late in the game, and its other typing is already weak to psychic. I won't harp on about this anymore, I'll just conclude this by saying that instead of adding counters to the psychic type, Game Freak really more added checks in the form of moves like Bite, Crunch, and Shadow Ball being available to Pokémon who don't quite necessarily get the stab from them, and I guess there are a few Steel types who aren't too bad if you're willing to put up with the barrier to entry on getting them. Getting back on track is, uh... This... thing? It's unknown what the point of this Pokémon was. Yeah, it has one move and really bad stats. Getting back on track is, um, this thing? It only has four moves and is designed around being a one-trick. Wobbuffet is a neat idea, just don't go trying to use it in the single player unless you really want to pull your hair out from trying to predict the AI. Getting back on track is, um, okay, I'll stop this joke. Girafferig is actually a pretty good Pokemon, despite its goofy appearance. Hey, wait a minute. Actually, this thing does invoke some of the same feelings I had about Sudowoodo. It makes a pretty good mixed attacker, even if it doesn't exactly have the best stats in the world. It does get the job done, and it has a good moveset to boot. Try it out if you've never had the chance to do so before, you might be surprised. Don't forget what I said earlier about badges making some otherwise mediocre Pokémon ridiculously strong. Normal types like Girafferig are a very good example of this. Pineco and Fortress are interesting at the least. You'd think that they're just tanks, and while yes, they do have a good defense stat, 90 attack is nothing to laugh at. It's just a shame that they don't really have any moves to back that up. Aside from Pin Missile as an egg move, which isn't even that good of a move to begin with, they've got no stab, which sucks since they really could have used more Bug and Steel type moves, since we're already more than halfway through this list and these types have nothing decent to show for it yet. Alright, who's next? Snubble and Granbull are normal type Pokemon with good move pools, but not the best stats in the world. Wait, I feel like I said this before. Snubble and Granbull are Pokemon that in Gold and Silver are only available in one map of the game with a 1% encounter rate, but are more available in Crystal. Wow, I'm getting some serious deja vu with this thing. In all seriousness though, despite it sharing some details that plagued earlier Pokemon, these two are actually kind of okay. I guess. No, it doesn't have the most balanced stats in the world, but its attack is so absurdly high that it kinda makes up for it, on top of the fact of being a normal type Pokemon, which is really good in this game. As for moves, it's got some stuff in the late game, but when it's first caught, you'll have to be willing to use a TM or two to get it up to par. While it's simply not available that easily in any game other than Crystal, I'd actually recommend trying it out if you're playing that game specifically, otherwise maybe pass over the pupper. Shuckle is a gimmick in every sense of the word. When it was first introduced, it had a unique typing, and it still has the highest defenses of any Pokémon. It has a decent supportive move pool too, but that's where the positives end. It just doesn't have anything other than some stall tactics to turn any battle into your favor. Shuckle is a perfect example of just because you're different doesn't mean you are useful. And no, it does not learn any bug-type moves. And speaking of, here we go. Heracross is my boy, but right now he isn't. Okay, hear me out. Heracross is a great Pokemon, but he did not fill his role in this first appearance. First, I'll let you look at the stats. Those are some pretty good stats. Now, look at the list of fighting type moves he has... Well, well then. How about that bug move? Yeah, Megahorn is a good move when you finally learn it at level 54, and that's the only bug move he has. What? No, Fury Code does not count. Get the hell out of here. As for other coverage options, you only have Earthquake, and that's a move that you get pretty late in the game, so for all practical purposes, you have a great Pokémon that has a very limited moveset. The only good thing Heracross does is spam normal moves, and as we already know, there's better Pokémon that do that. Speaking of, Ursaring invokes some of the same feelings that I get from Granbull, actually. It's a normal type with a large move pool and a huge attack stat, but Ursaring is just a little bit better at it, though you can only get him much later on in the game. 
The only thing that Granbull gets that Ursaring doesn't is Shadow Ball, which is an important move, so keep that in mind. Other than that, Ursaring has not the worst special attack in the world, just enough to keep it in mind considering Generation 2's overall difficulty, so throw on an Elemental Punch if you want. All in all, Ursaring is a pretty okay filler Pokémon to balance out your team at this point in the game. One thing to keep in mind though is that you'll most likely be catching this thing at a pretty low level compared to the rest of your team. Just don't expect it to stand out that much other than using some strong normal type moves. Corsola is a Pokémon that exists. If you've ever heard anyone make fun of Love Disk in Generation 3, this should ring a bell. Instead of speed being its only good stat, it's Corsola's defenses, which aren't even really backed up by its HP, and its moveset is really bad. Not much more to say. Delibird is a bad Pokémon. Keep in mind that in the generation with one of the lowest numbers of new additions in the series, this is the third Pokémon that I've just straight up wanted to skip because of how undeniably garbage this thing is. I don't even need to explain it. Mantine is not a terrible Pokémon, but not one that I could recommend either. It's a good enough water type on the surface, with good bulk and all of that, but it doesn't really separate itself outside of the pack of other bulky water types from Generation 1 that do the same thing. If you're really trying to stick with a Generation 2 only thing, and absolutely have to have a bulky water Pokémon, then fine, go ahead with Mantine, but don't say I didn't warn you. Skarmory. Now here is a nice Grade A Generation 2 Pokémon, and probably the best Steel type in the game. Now, don't get me wrong, I love my boys Scissor and Magneton, but they don't quite hold up as well as Skarmory does in the original game. I also gotta give him props for being one of the only Generation 2 Pokémon that still hold up pretty well in today's meta, despite the power creep that the series has. It's got a fantastic typing, great stats for tanking and dealing a little bit of damage on the side, and just enough of a moveset to feel useful. The only downside I can think of is how late in the game that you obtain it, and the fact that it's got a little bit of a version exclusivity, but there's other ways to get it early on if you head straight for it. Fanfi is another Pokémon that is made more accessible in Crystal, but thankfully there isn't really much to say about it. It's got the same problems that Heracross has. Good stats, but not really good moves to take advantage of them, at least in the single-player context. It only gets Earthquake, and even then it would be at the very tail end of the game, so you'd better be off just popping the TM of it on him. Smeargle is an interesting case. Normally it would be easy to just write it off as a Pokémon with bad stats and a good move pool, but that's just the thing. Smeargle doesn't just have a good move pool, it has the best move pool. It can literally learn any four moves in the entire game. Its bad stats are the only thing keeping it from being completely busted, which people still argue that it is anyway. The only thing keeping me from fully recommending Smeargle is the time and patience investment that you need to put into it to get that perfect moveset. Other than that, its usefulness is only limited by your creativity, very fitting for a paint-themed Pokémon. And last but not least, the big girl herself, Miltank. I really love how they handle getting Miltank and, by extension, Tauros in these games. You just come out of struggling through beating a well-built one from Whitney, which sets up how nice this Pokémon can be, and not too much long after that you can get one of your own. While its attack stat isn't quite exactly as impressive as Granbull or Ursaring, you can get access to it much earlier, and it's more built for tanking and being faster. Tauros is more in line with what those other two try to do, but either one of these make a great substitute if you're trying to use the other Pokémon later down the line. At least we finally get to end on a positive note. Hey, wait a second! So at the end of the day, after all that yammering and bitching, what do we have left? 24. 24 Pokémon that I'd consider usable, maybe up to 10 more if you want to take a risk on someone that's obviously underpowered, but maybe not completely trash. That's inexcusable. Why out of 101 new designs were only a small handful of them both useful and readily available to the player? And I get it, you don't have to use a full team of 6 Generation 2 specific Pokémon. That's just the thing though, you probably shouldn't. The game clearly encourages you to use a good number of Gen 1 Pokémon in the game, even having multiple areas have exclusively Gen 1 Pokémon in their encounter tables, even in Johto. It really feels like to me that the devs just did not have any confidence in their new Pokémon, so they either hid them away from the player to make them feel more rewarding to finally get, 
or just made most of what you had left notoriously bad so the player would just rely on old favorites to get the job done. Which is really how you should not handle a sequel in my opinion, and I'm so glad that they immediately learned their lesson moving forward. In no other game in the series do you see this issue of largely unusable Pokémon or any of them that are locked behind the credits other than a handful of legendary encounters, except for Generation 4, which was immediately rectified by the time Platinum came out. All of this to say that if they really want to excite the player and encourage them to try out all the new features that the sequel had in store, they should have made all the new Pokémon available in Johto, including whatever evolutionary items or other trading bullshit necessary, and maybe save some of the old favorites for their exciting post-game segment. With, of course, actually scaling their levels so that they'd actually be useful. Like, if you're gonna jerk off that nostalgia boner anyway, you may as well save most of the Gen 1 Pokémon for then. You know, actually matching up the feeling of revisiting an old favorite area with the old favorite Pokémon that you can catch there. It'd be really nice if Game Freak had, you know, another opportunity to present these games again to the player in a new light and maybe rectify some of these issues that the original games had, but hey, that's a fucking stupid idea. Why would anybody do something like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. I know it seems like I've been rambling on for what feels like hours by now, but that's just because I really do love the Pokémon games, and I have a lot to say about them. Even after shitting on these games for so long, if you've asked me if I thought Generation 2 was bad, I'd say, no, not really, but I'd easily tell you that they're not exactly my favorite either. Part of me wants to think that this was mostly just the result of Game Freak not really knowing what they were doing at the time, and you know, that's okay, making games is hard. All the ingredients are still there, there's potential in these games to have something really incredible. I just don't think that the pacing and the balancing were done right. Like, there's some really cool shit put into it, and fuck me if Generation 2 doesn't have some of the most memorable aesthetics of any game in the series. Like, I know this word doesn't really have any objective weight to it, but I think GSC are really comfy games. They've got this relaxing atmosphere, like you're exploring a home that you had in another lifetime. My only issue is that this kind of feeling carries over into the gameplay at times. It can be too relaxed, and not everyone's gonna find that compelling. Don't get me wrong, I can enjoy easy games from time to time, but when I'm going back to a Pokémon game, I definitely want to be challenged more than I want to relive an atmosphere. Well, in the end, is Generation 2 really overrated? I know I didn't really answer that myself, I've laid down some of the facts on what I feel about the game, Yes, I do personally think the games get a little bit more praise than they should, but don't let my shitty opinion tarnish your idea of the game. If you still love Generation 2 to the ends of the earth, even after my spiel, go ahead. Don't let me stop you. It's still a good time. In fact, all of the mainline Pokémon games are still fantastic as video games, excluding any differing opinions on which are better than others. I just hope that maybe some of what I've said has sunk in with at least somebody to get them thinking about the games they love more critically. Sometimes, an old favorite just doesn't quite hold the same weight it once did the first time around. And you know what? That's okay. It only shows that we're growing and changing all the time. We're always evolving. Thank you everybody so much for watching this first video of mine. I know this one was a pretty lengthy one, but I've got plans to talk about other games in the future, and it'll be more positive this time, I swear. So if you want to see stuff like that, please subscribe, and if you enjoyed the video, please share it and leave it a thumbs up. And feel free to leave a comment as well, even if it's just you telling me my opinions are trash. Alright, thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.